Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 119 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. David Musnick, and the topic of the show is traumatic brain injury. Dr. David Musnick is a sports medicine, functional medicine, and internal medicine physician in Bellevue, Washington, practicing at Peak Medicine. He has developed a functional medicine approach to healing the brain after concussion and traumatic brain injury, originally presented at an Institute for Functional Medicine annual meeting in 2017. He has written the chapter on concussion and traumatic brain injury in the book Integrative Neurology. In his practice, he integrates supplements, exercise, diet, and treatment for metals, toxins, mold, and infections. He has expanded his approach to also treating mild cognitive impairment. Dr. Musnick is a specialist in prolotherapy and all aspects of orthopedic and sports medicine. And now my interview with Dr. David Musnick. This is my first show on traumatic brain injuries or TBIs and concussions. Head injuries can play a major role in chronic illness and addressing them often leads to higher ground. I'm very excited today to have Dr. David Musnick here to share approaches for recovering from TBIs in his integrative practice outside of Seattle. Thanks for being here so much today, Dr. Musnick. You're welcome. What drew you to the world of medicine, and more specifically, how did you become interested in working with patients with brain injuries? What was your background and experience in traumatic brain injuries and concussions? It's a long story what drew me to the world of medicine, but, but um, um, in regards to um, working with people with head injuries, um, I went to medical school at University of California, San Francisco, um, and I actually um, did a rotation in a uh, Santa Clara Valley uh, Medical Center um, and spent two weeks in the brain injury um, section and two weeks in spinal cord. And that got me um, um, interested in, in those areas. But those, I mean, in order to be uh, it, there, you'd, you'd be hospitalized for a head injury or spinal cord injury. But that initially got me interested. But that got me interested in physical medicine and in rehabilitation. Um, and then I, I went on, uh, past my internal medicine to do a sports medicine fellowship and, um, and then practice sports medicine. And I would see patients with, uh, whiplash and neck injuries and head injuries, um, you know, in the sports medicine part of my practice, but I would have a lot of patients that were being managed by a neurologist ask for my opinion on things. And I was gradually accumulating information about things like BDNF and um, neural inflammation and brain challenging um, systems and games and neuroprotection and things. And, 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 and then um, in uh, the fall of 2016, the Institute of Functional Medicine asked me to create an integrative functional medicine approach to healing the brain after head injury in order to present it at the brain meetings that they were going to do, brain and neuroplasticity in Los Angeles um, in uh, June of 2017. So I I took on the challenge because the program I had developed wasn't as comprehensive as it needed to be and um, wasn't as uh, research-based as it needed to be. So I took on the challenge of reading every research article um, and putting together the pathophysiology in a real um, integrated program to heal the brain after head injury that, that really makes sense every step of the way, I think. Talk to us about the common types of head injuries that you see in your practice. Do they have to be a significant traumatic accident or can even a small, often forgotten bump to the head become a contributor to a long term chronic illness? Well, yeah, I mean, so I see um, lots of car accidents and where they might not even actually hit their head. 
but there's this coup contra coup force. And often flexion and extension, or it depends, you know, most people are rear-ended, but it depends on that type of force. And I see, um, you know, mountain bike injuries uh, where people fall off their mountain bike. I see ski injuries, uh, snowboard injuries, and then I see people fall. Then I see kids who bang their heads on almost anything. Um, and what I would say is that the amount of the head injury that's caused has to do with many different factors. So, because sometimes people that have what seems like bald or head injuries will have, still have quite a few symptoms. And so every patient I see, I've got to put it together about the picture that they have, the stage that they have, the pathophysiology why they're having so many symptoms or the symptoms they're having, I have to characterize it. What brain regions are having symptoms in that person? Because then I need to treat those brain regions um, to uh, in, sort of restore reserve and get well above reserve. Can we have a head injury or TBI that's not the result of some external physical trauma? So things like chemical exposures or mold exposures, can those lead to what we're talking about here in terms of brain injury? They can lead to brain injury, but not the same type of brain injury. So, you know, when we talk about the pathophysiology, we realize that a lot of other things are actually compromising people's brains and um, causing insults to people's brains um, and like mold biotoxins, uh, like co-infections, like um, neurotoxins. We're exposed to a lot of neurotoxins and um, like LPS, like a polysaccharide from post uh, perennial endotoxemia. And so a lot of people have different things going on even, you know, before the head injury and then the head injury happens. And so what I would say is that a classic head injury is, is you know, a physical trauma. Um, now, the things you're talking about are non-physical insults to the brain that one has to also take into account um, in regards to brain health. What's the difference between a TBI and a concussion? So can I have a traumatic brain injury without concussion? Can I have a concussion without a TBI? You can have a traumatic brain injury with a concussion, but if you can't have a traumatic brain injury really without a, without a concussion if it's traumatic. Um, you can have a concussion without a subsequent traumatic brain injury. So the way I characterize this, and it's, it's, it's kind of important because there's a number of terms being used. So there's concussion, with, which is the actual event, you know, that someone fell, hit their heads, possibly saw stars or lost consciousness. That's the event of the head injury. I had someone might say, well, they had a concussion. Well, post-concussion syndrome is many different symptoms after that, you know, headache, dizziness, nausea, decreased appetite, poor sleep, mood instability. There's all kinds of uh, symptoms are characterized under post-concussion syndrome. But traumatic brain injury is really deficit in re uh, a region or regions of the brain that will show up when you do testing um, with either questionnaires, and that's how I do it, or, you know, history taking um, and physical exam, that there's deficit in function um, in parts of the brain, and therefore we'd characterize those people as traumatic brain injury. You know, and of course, if someone had a bleed um, and they're unconscious or in a coma, that's a severe traumatic brain injury. Most of what we're talking about here would be mild to moderate traumatic brain injury without a a, a definite brain bleed. You just touched on some of the symptoms, but what are the symptoms that one should watch for after they have a head injury that might then lead them to consult with someone like yourself? And then taking that a little bit further, many people listening have a chronic illness, maybe have not thought about head injury or traumatic brain injury as a contributor. What are some of the clues that might lead them to want to explore this area further? Yeah, well, if you've had a head injury before and now you're having something else going on 
and quote unquote, and you're having brain symptoms, brain fog, cognitive dysfunction, you know, problems with memory, problems with executive function, problems with organization, mood instability is a big deal. Um, then, then just the fact that you've had a head injury, that person has had a head injury or had injuries before, could have lost to damage to neurons and synaptic density so that now whatever they're dealing with, even if it's a little head injury in addition to the other ones, or they have mold biotoxins or co-infections could be causing much more loss of function than we might ordinarily think it would. So the head injury part is important to deal with at any time that someone's having cognitive symptoms or emotional instability, liability. Um, and so what, my, my thinking is I would not want a person to have a head injury without having this approach. Because this approach that we're talking about, that I'm going to be talking about more, deals with the pathophysiology, deals with trying to augment nerve stem cell migration and, 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 and health, and then uh, restoration of synaptic networks. And those concepts are not thought of in a conventional method of basically make the diagnosis and refer to a few therapists, which is the, the average treatment, because there are no drugs for um, traumatic brain injury. And since there are no drugs in the conventional approach, they will diagnose it and then refer to a few different therapists. What is the contribution of a TBI in the development of later, more serious neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's or ALS or even Alzheimer's? And then where does CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, where does that fit into this discussion around traumatic brain injury? Well, traumatic brain injury has been implicated in, in, as a possible risk factor for the possible de future development of dementia. Uh, and um, CTE, or chronic, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, as well as um, autoimmune diseases of the brain. And um, the reason, uh, you know, for this is, and we'll be getting into this in more detail, but um, the reason for this may be because after traumatic brain injury, a person can develop antibodies to the blood-brain barrier and even antibodies to different brain tissues. And so the concept of uh, blood-brain barrier antibodies and uh, antibodies to different brain tissues, you know, with neural inflammation can set the stage for these autoimmune diseases. Now, I know that there's a relationship between, you know, uh, head injury and Alzheimer's, um, head injury and different types of dementias, head injury and Parkinson's. Um, I'm not completely clear in the literature about head injury and MS um, or, AL, or ALS, but it would, you know, potentially make some sense in regard to the concept of autoantibodies. Could a traumatic brain injury be a trigger for some systemic hypersensitivity in patients, for example, mast cell activation syndrome, or could a TBI be a trigger for impacting the limbic system in some way so that our perception of what is safe versus not safe around us is impaired in some way? Well, yeah, absolutely. A TBI can affect the limbic system, which you could think of as the emotional regulation system. And um, I see some patients um, that are presenting with head injuries with mostly emotional symptoms, um, mood instability, irritability, very quick to get angry. Um, so, yeah, I treat a lot of people with limbic system, um, what I would call limbic system uh, injury and dysfunction after head injury, um, and it's not a, simply a, quote, drug problem, that they need an antidepressant or something. They need healing of the limbic system. 
And do you see mast cell activation syndrome as a potential result of a brain injury, or is there not necessarily a connection between those two? Well, I definitely see people with head injuries and mast cell activation syndrome. Um, I mean, probably one could link them. I've, I've had a hard time finding absolute mechanisms there. I mean, what you, I mean, if someone has had mast cell activation syndrome and then had a head injury, the mast cell activation syndrome can make it more difficult for them to heal. Um, and that you have to work on stabilizing the mast cell activation syndrome and doing things to stabilize mast cells. Um, because that's gonna, you know, that's gonna be acting up in the GI tract and may, you know, the release of a lot of histamine can make for mood instability being even worse. Um, and so, so I'd say, yes, what, so, so this brings up this issue, what do you have to think about when someone has a head injury? Because it's not the usual, which is the doctor rules out a, bl a brain bleed and then says rest. And then they get referred to a neurologist and they say, I'm gonna refer you to a speech therapist or physical therapist or an occupational therapist. That's all fine. But it's like, what's the goal of those treatments? And the real questions need to be, not what's the goal of the treatment you're referring someone to, but what is the pathophysiology and the other conditions that can affect the brain um, what, what, that you need to keep uh, thinking about while you're trying to heal the brain in that particular individual, including mast cell activation syndrome, including neurotoxins, including um, infections, um, including immune system dysfunction, um, uh, EMF. There's a lot you have to think of to help heal someone's brain. Um, yes. So when someone comes into your office, how do you assess and ultimately diagnose a traumatic brain injury? Do you get some benefit from MRIs or CTs or PET scans or neuroquants or any of those types of things? Or how do you arrive at the conclusion that a TBI may be in play in a particular patient? Well, most of the, what I summarize about imaging studies is they're mostly not useful. Um, so CAT scans are useful initially if one suspects a bleed, like a significant head injury or moderate head injury, to rule out a bleed. Um, and that would be done, you know, usually the first day, possibly the second day. It would be useful for really bad headache after a head injury or a hit to the temporal area where you're trying to real, rule out a temporal artery um, bleed. So, and then after that, CAT scans really are not useful. And I've seen patients that have had multiple CAT scans because they go back with more symptoms. And then some doc will do another CAT scan. I'm like thinking, oh my goodness, this person has had radiation therapy um, because they're getting CAT scans and it's, they're being exposed to the, you know, the radiation, the CAT scans. So I'm okay with one CAT scan to rule out a bleed during the first day or two, but not any CAT scans after that, unless there's it's a concern of another bleed because that imaging study is not good for uh, things other than bleeds and big tumors. MRIs in general are not sensitive enough to pick up head injury. The NeuroQuant is an MRI of sorts that can pick up loss of, of uh, brain tissue, but it's not generally that useful. And it, it doesn't help me guide necessarily my treatment that much but will um, cost a patient a fair amount of copay, or if it's an auto accident, will take a lot out of their uh, plan, and I don't find it that useful. The only time I use NeuroQuant is in a medical legal case where I'm involved with um, you know, taking care of the person who had, was hit in a car or hit as a pedestrian or something, and there's a medical legal case against the person who hit them. Then a NeuroQuant may be helpful. A neuroquant can actually also backfire because if you don't find anything, then the other side says, well, you didn't find anything. Um, so um, in PET scanning, I don't find that helpful. Spec scanning can be helpful. Um, I don't order it that much. Um, I'm generally doing a history, um, doing a really in-depth neurological exam with really good balance testing and really good neurological testing. And I have a questionnaire that I use that's a three-page questionnaire 
that tests each brain region with questions on a scale of zero to four to see if there's issues in that brain region. And that's one of my most useful tools. When we have a head injury, let's talk about the underlying process that follows or pathophysiology that happens in terms of the impact to the brain. Is it that there's a circulation deficit or hypoperfusion? Is it that there's reduced oxygenation? What are the mechanisms that follow the head injury? Well, initially, yeah, initially you have this shearing. You have shearing forces on tissue that starts damaging the tissue um, biomechanically. And then you have relative, and then you have um, bleeding, but small amounts of bleeding, not like one big pocket of blood, but small amounts of bleeding. Um, and uh, then you have deficits of oxygenation. Um, those, are the, those are the initial processes. Um, and then those processes start other pathophysiology like excitotoxicity processes, and we can go into detail on these other pathophysiology processes, but um, mitochondrial energy deficit um, and um, neural inflammation, um, blood-brain barrier changes. So there's a sequence of events that I think of depending on how many days out they are from the head injury, which gets into what we call staging. Um, but the, and, and the pathophysiology has been outlined really well in the studies on mice and rats. Um, so that pathophysiology has been outlined fairly well. Um, but the funny thing is, uh, most doctors don't take any of it into account to treat the patients. Are there specific areas of the brain that are more sensitive to the impact of a brain injury or concussion in terms of the symptom potential that could be created? So for example, is it worse to get hit in the back of the head versus the front of the head or are any of these potentially problematic? Well, anything is problematic because, I mean, uh, very common people get hit on the back of the head. Like, like say you're in an auto accident, if someone rear-ended you, um, you know, you're going to likely at least hit the back of your head on the seat um, rest support, you know. Um, so that that would be some kind of impact. Um, but if, if you didn't hit your head that much, you could uh, move your head a lot in a whiplash, in a coup contra coup. So that could injure both the frontal lobe and the cerebellum, the hindbrain. Now, um, the... Often times the temporal lobe gets injured because there's bony structure in the brain which the temporal lobes are up against. And so in a flexion extension injury or in a rotational injury, part of the temporal lobes are often going to get injured as well. Um, the hippocampus frequently gets injured, um, which is your memory center. Um, and what's also um, interesting is the vagus nerve gets tractioned very commonly, and that gets injured. And, um, uh, but, you know, with frontal lobe injury, you get all kinds of problems with executive function, um, organization, organization, planning. If it's really bad, people lose inhibition. So, I mean, every brain area has, has its problems. And I think it's extremely important to be able to tell the patient, you are showing deficits in these regions. And like in list, the, the deficits and the regions, and this is going to be my plan to rehabilitate these regions because if you can figure out what brain regions have been injured, then you can actually, as part of your program, do brain training for that region. How is the conventional approach, we've talked about this a little bit, how is the conventional response or approach to a head injury different from how you're approaching concussions and TBIs? What is your goal of therapy? Well, I do everything that the conventional approach does in regards to label the diagnosis, do a complete neurological exam. My exam might be even more detailed, especially with balance. And then, uh, like I said, and my, my, um, my knowledge of this is because I've had so many patients telling me what happens when they go to the neurologist or the primary care. They just keep telling them, well, what can you expect? You had a concussion. Um, you have post-concussion syndrome, you have mild TBI. So sometimes they'll be referred to a speech therapist. Um, referral to a physical therapist may make sense if they have balance problems. You know, I do that. Um, 
assessing them for vision problems, real important, and referring them to a uh, trauma vision specialist, really important. I do that. But what's, what's not done in the conventional approach is to look at the underlying pathophysiology and talk, and talk to the patient about how do we modulate this? How do we decrease neural inflammation? How do we um, decrease excitotoxicity? How do we augment mitochondrial function? You know, how do we improve um, um, the ability of nerve stem cells to survive? Uh, you know, there's a, a whole lot of pathophysiology that's going on, which then can lead to what we call secondary brain damage. So the initial brain damage is caused by the hit to the head or the motion to the head. But secondary brain damage is everything that goes on after that, that conventional uh, and the conventional approach is not addressed at all, really. And then, you know, I, I do use a lot of um, supplements and, and vitamins in my program because there's been a lot of research with mice and rats where they're using different supplements and, and vitamins to see what can be modulated in regard to neural inflammation and the pathophysiology. So I will use certain supplements, vitamins, and dietary interventions. I have never had a patient tell me in it when they were doing the conventional approach that any dietary interventions were used. So, so my program is quite expansive in terms of addressing the pathophysiology, addressing any comorbid things like, you know, co-infections and EMF, and neurotoxins, and mast cell activation. I address the issue of autoimmunity, the blood-brain barrier, um, as well as autoimmunity to brain tissues, and then talk about how to protect the brain, how to stimulate the brain, and then how to modulate the different pathophysiology processes, and then work on the lifestyle issues of exercise and sleep um, and diet that really affect the brain. So the way I maybe would summarize it is that the, the more conventional approach is to watch and wait, and your approach is more about creating a healing opportunity for the patient. Yeah, and addressing the specific pathophysiology and comorbid issues that are really important to preserve brain tissue, um, to improve synaptic density, and improve brain function. How long after a head injury can one hope to still improve their situation? If the injury was years ago, is there a point where it's too late? Is there still hope? And do younger people respond better to treatment than older people? Well, yeah, and that's an interesting question. So anytime after a head injury, I've had patients literally 10 years later, I've had people, you know, well, what is CTE? It's like, you know, people years later. So I've had success with any number of months or years after a head injury. Now, younger people do seem to heal faster than older people because they have more brain reserves, theoretically, theoretically. They have more brain reserve, of course, because you start out with more brain reserve. Um, what's really interesting is young people generally respond incredibly well to frequency-specific microcurrent for brain healing. Um, but in general, they respond uh, extremely well, although, you know, like kids in elementary school, they're more likely to re-injure themselves because they don't have as much spatial awareness and will re-injure themselves in physical therapy. Um, but they generally heal better. Um, the older a person is, the more likely they have less brain reserve at the time they got the head injury. Because, you know, we can have brain shrinkage over time from aging. And that just brings up the issue that a lot of the things that I'm talking about are very important for keeping your brain healthy. And so it's a lot of things I'm talking about in terms of pathophysiology, are there, it's very related to brain health in general, because I don't assume that anybody necessarily has a perfectly healthy brain. I mean, we all have stressed brains in some respect. They're one of our more stressed organs, and we have to do things to generally try to keep our brains healthy. Um, and a lot of the concepts in regards to the pathophysiology after brain injury, some of the pathophysiology is going on when people haven't had a brain injury that they, you know, they, they have to, um, you know, do things to, for brain health in general. So um, hopefully that answered your question. So you've talked about this concept of brain reserves, which I 
kind of think of as the brain's ability to adapt to some stressor? What is brain reserve? What are some of the factors that influence how much reserve we have? And should we be doing things to increase our reserve, even if we haven't had a known injury? Well, yes, we should be. In general, I think everybody, especially people over the age of 25, um, should be doing things to increase brain reserve because the more brain reserve you have in different brain regions, the less likely you're going to have symptoms. You know, there's a very high um, incidence and prevalence of Alzheimer's and dementia and people with brain dysfunction in the United States, in Canada, all around the world. Um, and so it, it's not as low as, you know, we were taught in medical school. It's like there's a lot of people with brain issues including cogn mild cognitive impairment, brain fog, people saying I'm not as sharp as I was, or people saying, you know, what can you expect? Like, you know, I'm in my mid-50s. I mean, I'm thinking your brain should be healthy in your mid-50s, and they think it shouldn't be. So brain reserve, is uh, the way I explain it to a patient is I'll draw a graph. And in this graph, you know, I have a line, and I'll say, let's just – you know, let's just talk about this part of your brain that works on memory, like the hippocampus, okay? If you go below the level of brain reserve, you're going to start having problems with short-term memory. In other words, the level of brain reserve in terms of this concept is below which you have known problems, symptoms that you are aware of, the person is aware of, or maybe someone else is aware of. I mean, it's pretty bad if you're, that person is having symptoms and they're not even aware of it. And that happens too, but that's usually in more advanced cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's. They're not even aware of it. But, but when people are aware, okay, I think I'm having some issues. I can't remember that person's name. I can't find a word. I go into a room. I can't, I can't remember why I went in there. I keep losing things. So that's, that's a concept in terms of below a level of reserve we're going to have that person's going to have symptoms. The higher you, uh, higher the person is above that level of reserve in that area of the brain, the less likely they are to have symptoms from either a head injury or from um, all the other things that are insulting our brains. So you don't need to have a head injury to have memory problems or, you know, the different problems people are having these days with their brain. There's many things that are affecting their brains. So, so I tell people, we not only want to get you just just above the level of reserve because that's you might not have symptoms there, but then you're more susceptible. Because, for instance, I had a patient who was having um, just for instance memory problems, um, and she she hit her head on some I think it was a rental car hood in Europe, and then she followed my program and got a lot better. But because of certain reasons, she couldn't continue doing it to really really increase brain reserve because I tell people you're not even stopping the supplements until you're three months without any symptoms in these in these brain regions in these particular brain regions at least three months because what do people usually do they stop treatment when they're asymptomatic for a week they just stop oh I'm fine well in terms of the brain that's just barely above the level of brain reserve you want them much better than that otherwise they're susceptible to stress and other things that could bring them below the level of reserve again. So what are some of those other factors beyond head injury that influence how much reserve we have? What are some of the stressors that reduce our reserve? Yeah, and you can even think of reduced reserve as reduced neurons, um, reduced synaptic uh, connection, reduced synaptic density, uh, loss of um, microglial tissue, or microglial cells. The M1 phase is more inflammatory and less, less functional for neurotrophic factors. So there's many things. I mean, you know, like um, EMF, uh, exposure electromagnetic fields. Some people are more sensitive than others. I'm very concerned about 5G um, because I think that's really going to stress um, people's brain reserve and the blood-brain barrier. Um, uh, the neurotoxins that people take in from food, um, the lipopolysaccharide that gets released from post-endotoxemia, um, you know, post-prandial endotoxemia and lipopolysaccharide can injure the brain and cause neural inflammation. Um, if they've had mold biotoxins, if they have any um, infections 
uh, in, in the brain. And I'm not, not talking about outright bacterial infections. I'm talking about chronic smoldering infections. I mean, there's so many things that can compromise the brain, and especially stress, but also lack of sleep. I mean, it's been shown that people that sleep less than or equal to six hours a night um, have neural inflammation that persists for at least a week and can damage the blood-brain barrier. So, you know, lifestyle, all the lifestyle things um, will affect the brain and all these other conditions will affect people's brain that can affect brain reserve, including the, the former head injuries, if, they have, if they've had any. So let's come back to this idea of stages that you mentioned. So what are the different stages? What are the unique characteristics of each stage? And at a very high level, how does the stage of the head injury impact your exploration and your putting together a treatment protocol? So, you know, I would characterize the stages in a certain way as acute, subacute, and chronic. And this characterization has been done with many different injuries. Musculoskeletal injuries can usually be characterized that way. Um, and what's interesting in, uh, in frequency-specific microcurrent, we use that characterization for, for musculoskeletal injuries and for head injuries. So the acute stage um, is when there's more issues with um, bleeding, um, the mechanical shearing forces, um, hypooxygenation, um, and, um, you know, an excitotoxicity is going on then. There's the beginning of neural inflammation. Um, and and maybe, that, maybe that stage, you might say, is occurring for the first week. Um, and what's interesting about that is that hyperbaric oxygen can be very appropriate then because hyperbaric oxygen increases oxygenation. So whereas I see patients that the other doc didn't even think about hyperbaric oxygen until they're very chronic. Okay, well, you haven't responded to this therapy and that therapy. Uh, somebody read about HBOT. Let's try that. It's very appropriate right in the acute stage. So HBOT is actually appropriate in the acute stage and the subacute stage. It's most appropriate then as opposed to simply the chronic stage. So in the subacute stage, people are dealing a little bit more with um, – mitochondrial dysfunction in regard to energy dysfunction, the inability of the mitochondria to produce enough energy. They're dealing with excitotoxicity um, um, and they're dealing with potentially, and I said not everybody is, but potentially blood brain barrier issues. Um, they're, they're dealing with the loss, the, the loss of neurons, the loss of function. So, so the people can deteriorate, you know, from even, you know, what it seems like how they were doing in the first week and even start to tear anymore as the neuron density and the synaptic density gets less in the subacute phase until we start doing some things to try to regain that function. Um, so, and then in the subacute phase, there's, there's damage to the uh, microglial population as well as damage to the neuronal population and the synaptic density. Um, and there's probably not enough um, neurotrophic factors. It just depends on, you know, how their brain operates in regards to producing neurotrophic factors, what they're doing to induce neurotrophic factors. These are things like brain-derived nerve growth factor to stimulate, you know, neurogenesis and synaptic density. Um, in the chronic stage, that the majority of people are dealing with issues that chronic symptoms that haven't changed for a while, they plateaued, you know, that might be after 10 weeks. Um, they plateaued, they're having light sensitivity, potentially they're still having headaches. Um, there can be unresolved neck issues, um, but they're having problems with memory or emotional ability, um, different cognitive issues in brain regions that just haven't uh, resolved. Um, and then in those stages, the important things are asking questions like, what do we do to augment nerve stem cells? What do we do to augment synaptic density? What do we do to shift the microglial cells away from the M1 morphology more into the M2 morphology? Um, what do we do to increase brain-derived nerve growth factor and these trophic factors? Um, you know, and of course, um, improving lifestyle factors, diet. Um, and um, what do we do to train the brain? Um, what brain training can we do? Because brain training is really important for increasing synaptic density, increasing brain reserve, 
So, um, you know, chronic phase, you know, for people can go on and on and on. Now, if someone has no symptoms and has passed the level of brain reserve in all brain regions, can you still say they're in the chronic phase? No, you probably wouldn't. You'd say they're asymptomatic. They've healed from the brain injury. We don't know how much, you know, absolute healing they've had, but you don't always know until they had another brain injury or something that insults the brain to see how easy it is for them to have symptoms. You've touched on a number of these components of your treatment model, but talk us through as we get into more treatment discussion, what are some of the components of the treatment model that limit brain damage, that increase brain reserve and lead someone towards a path to healing their brain injury? Well, you know, one of the most important things uh, would be to limit and modulate neural inflammation. So neural inflammation would be inflammatory modulators in the brain itself. Um, and so limiting neural inflammation is really, really important. Um, so uh, that's, you know, one thing. And, and, and neural inflammation is limited by having enough sleep, deep sleep, more than eight hours, ideally. Um, neural inflammation is limited um, by um, protecting the brain from neurotoxins protecting the brain from lipopolysaccharides. So working on the gut and the GI tract is extremely important. Neural inflammation is limited by a special type of curcumin called long vita that passes into the brain. Um, uh, so curcumin is extremely important in neural, limiting neural inflammation. And then um, flavonoids will modulate um, neural inflammation to some extent. So that's a big component. And then um, limiting excitotoxicity is really important because excitotoxicity can lead to cell death, but it also leads to substances inside the cell, neuronal cells or microglial cells leaking out into the surrounding tissue, like you know mitochondrial components or ATP, um, different things, even neurotransmitters just leaking out into the surrounding tissue that's, that, that are very um, inflammatory um, and keep up the excitotoxic response. So really limiting excitotoxicity is very important. Um, and um, I'd say, you know, there's free radical damage that's caused by the excitotoxicity and by mitochondrial dysfunction. So limiting free radical damage is really important because free radicals damage neurons, they damage microglial cells, um, they damage the blood-brain barrier, they damage brain tissue. Um, and then, you know, it's really important to then evaluate and treat potentially the blood-brain barrier. Um, it's important to evaluate um, uh, and, and look at the concept of can we mobilize and um, improve the survival of nerve stem cells because nerve stem cells only exist in certain parts of the brain. And the only way to get new nerves developing is to help the nerve stem cells either migrate, uh, migrate and survive because they can become ner new nerve cells, which then put out the synaptic um, dendritic connections. So that's a very important goal um, as well. Um, and, you know, um, I think we'll talk more about, you know, other aspects, but limiting, uh, improving synaptic transmission is important, especially with serotonin and dopamine. And what's really interesting is dopaminergic transmission in the brain, which, which really affects mood, focus of concentration, um, it can really get disrupted, um, which brings up the issue of genomics. Because one of the things that I do in my program, I test the genetics of dopamine transmission and, need, and want to work on that if it seems like there's genetic issues that that person has regarding neurotransmitters and as well as methylation issues because you can really augment and optimize those things. Um, so those are just some of the pathophysiologies that we have to uh, address. You've talked about protecting the brain from further damage after a head injury. How do we protect the brain from further damage after an injury? Well, um, there's, so what, I always give a person um, recommendations and say, look, um, 
I don't want you doing any things that are physical that could risk falling or hitting your head. So like, you know, for three months, minimum, minimum, but especially the first six weeks, we don't want a secondary head injury because there's a phenomenon called the second impact syndrome that can be very severe. So, and conventional neurologists, they all know about that. So we don't want people participating in contact sports. Um, I'll often restrict physical education in children so they don't, they're not likely to hit their head. I'll tell kids when they're playing with other kids, you know, the funny thing is uh, you, you got to tell kids to keep about two feet apart from other kids, not six feet apart <laughs> because they swing their heads around. So I tell adults not to go up on ladders, uh, you know, anything that might um, affect a fall. If it's winter and there's snow on the ground, I tell them to get these yak track or micro uh, crampons on the bottom of their shoes so they won't slip and fall. If there's any balance issues, I'll ask them to use trekking poles or if it's bad, a walker or something, just anything to, you know, help decrease risk of falling. And then, you know, if they have balance issues, I'll have them see a physical therapist to work on balance issues or gait issues. Um, I'll have them wear stable shoes, more stable shoes, so they're less likely to, to fall um, and work on vision issues. So those are things. And then, you know, other things are like putting them on an organic diet, a non-GMO diet, um, a diet high in flavonoids will protect the brain. And then I will institute electromagnetic field protection suggestions that I want that person to do as much as possible. Um, like don't hold a cell phone to the head, use speaker mode, um, use a blue tube instead of a Bluetooth device. Blue tubes, you actually see the air tubes, which are actually, I have them here, show you. Can you see these blue tubes? <laughs> They're very clear. And they have almost no electromagnetic fields, so I haven't used those when they're using a, a cell phone. Um, I ask them to turn the, um, the router off at night so they're not being exposed to as much Wi-Fi. Um, so there's a lot of suggestions I have, which we're calling brain uh, protection. And if they're a bicyclist, um, I ask them to get a 6D helmet because 6D is a company that has designed bike helmets with two shells that have grommets in between, where the shells, if you fell, will take up rotational forces. And what's interesting is the rotational forces are some of the worst forces on the brain. So that I'll make a recommendation that if, especially if they're mountain bikers, but even if they're road bikers, get a 6D helmet so that protect yourself if you fall, because most bike helmets are not that protective. Very nice. Let's talk a little bit about the blood-brain barrier permeability that you've mentioned. I've heard in the past Dr. Dietrich Klinghart suggesting that EMFs potentially open the blood-brain barrier and that many of us or most of us in our modern society are walking around with open blood-brain barriers. Does this allow infections and toxins to enter the brain? Does a head injury itself also open this barrier? And then what are some of the techniques that we use to reseal a leaky brain? Yeah, well, yes, people can have, um, I call it um, blood-brain barrier permeability or blood-brain barrier um, autoimmunity. So what's interesting is that the blood-brain barrier um, has a structure and is composed of capillaries and um, brain cells, mostly astrocytes, um, glial cells, um, that there are proteins that are supposed to keep it sealed off. Um, and these proteins are similar to the ones in the gut, like zonulin and gluten and, and actin very similar. And they're supposed to keep it tight enough so that only certain sizes of molecules can get into the brain and waste products can get out. Okay. And so what can happen is in the area of the injury, the blood brain barrier can be damaged and become more permeable, become more leaky, more permeable. If that happens, um, then yes, um, like lipopolysaccharide from bacteria 
can get into the brain is extremely inflammatory. Neurotoxins from diet are more likely to get into the brain. Um, that's like pesticides, herbicides, metals. Um, and um, so, uh, and some, yeah, and people can have a blood brain barrier that's not functioning very well. And so, you know, if I see anybody with any kind of brain symptoms, head injury or not, because I do a lot of, I see a lot of patients uh, consult with a lot of people that don't have head, head injuries, but have brain problems. One of the first things I'll do is I'll check for antibodies to the blood brain barrier. I mean, the only evidence we really have is does someone have an antibody to the SB100, you know, uh, protein? And there are actually other antibodies that can be checked. So I'll check to, I'll check to SB100 and a few other antibodies with a panel. And depending, if someone's having a lot of cognitive issues, I'll also check antibodies to the brain. Because by definition, it's almost impossible to have antibodies to brain tissue without having antibodies to the blood-brain barrier. And so um, I think it's extremely important to assess and treat the blood-brain barrier in any brain-related set of symptoms, head injury or not, very important to do it with head injury. Now, how do, how do, um, I don't talk about resealing a leaky blood brain barrier. <laughs> That's a good, good uh, way of putting it because we can, uh, we can talk about that to a patient, but then they think about that flex seal stuff or whatever they just put over the hole. You know, I love that commercial because he does so many things with it. I wish we had a flex seal type thing for the brain, but there are things that can be done to help heal a, leaky blood brain barrier. Now, um, what I'd say is once it's diagnosed with the antibodies, I want to make an important point that the treatment has to go to the time where we get another antibody test and they have minimal or no antibodies to the blood brain barrier. Um, so I think that's extremely important. It's like, what are you done? You're done when maybe when there's no symptoms for three months, but also these tests have to become, you know, negative are very minimal. And that's really important. We have to retest. Um, so I will put people on uh, our lipoic acid, fairly high doses of it. Um, riboflavin uh, may have some effect on the blood-brain barrier. We absolutely have to reduce electromagnetic fields, like I talked about. That's very important. And I, I, um, I definitely use frequency-specific microcurrent to heal the blood-brain barrier. I um, I designed uh, frequencies and programs for the blood-brain barrier a number of years ago, as soon as I started um, getting these tests back. Um, and um, nobody really had designed really an approach to the blood-brain barrier. So I said, okay, I'm going to design the frequencies, and not the frequencies, but the programs, but the sequences of frequencies. So I will use that in my patients that are local, um, or sometimes I'll set up patients that are far away with um, frequency-specific microcurrent to heal the blood-brain barrier. Let's talk about the excitotoxicity a little bit more. So how is the excitotoxicity contributing to uh, symptoms after a brain injury? And then how do we minimize or address this excitotoxicity issue in a treatment protocol? Yeah, okay. So to make it somewhat simple because excitotoxicity is comp very, very complicated. Um, but one can think of, um, there's something called an NMDA receptor on a cell. Um, and um, there, there's a number of things that can set off the NMDA receptor, but if it's excessively um, stimulated, then a lot of calcium can rush into a cell very rapidly. Um, and, and one of the end products of excitotoxicity is cell death, um, release of internal contents to the outside, and oxidative, reactive oxygen um, species, uh, oxidative stress in the surrounding tissue. Um, and so it's, it also creates energy failure. It contributes to mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, and um, and so it's it's interesting because it occurs in the sub in the acute and subacute phase. But I've seen patients in the chronic phase 
where I think they have excitotoxicity. And it's part of their pathophysiology in the chronic stage to calm down the excitotoxicity. Um, and it's not usually thought of, hey, is it still you know, going on? I ask the question, I have to ask the question, what pathophysiology is going on in any patient? So um, it's very interesting actually that um, excitotoxicity may be somewhat countered by um, magnesium and especially magnesium three and eight. Magnesium three and eight apparently gets into the brain better than regular magnesium. Um, what's also interesting is that um, a, a product called PEA may uh, counter excitotoxicity. Um, and I think I said that riboflavin may do that. Also, you know, a lot of people take calcium supplements for bone support. I take them off of all free calcium. I don't want anybody on free calcium. So if they're on bone support, they're off of it. If they're taking calcium supplements, they're off of it. I don't want any more free calcium going into the brain. Um, but I think, you know, the excitotoxicity can uh, really increase emotional lability, brain fog, um, all kinds of symptoms in the brain, fatigue. So let's talk now about microglia a bit more. So microglia do things for us like producing BDNF that you talked about, trimming synapses. We know that after a head injury that they can shift to this pro-inflammatory M1 form that you mentioned that we ideally want this um, anti-inflammatory M2 form. So how do we shift the microglia back to this health promoting M2 type? Okay, so, you know, what's really interesting about microglia, they're, the, they're support cells. What a lot of people don't realize is about 90% of a person's brain is support cells, you know, and so, um, and 10% is neurons and synaptic, you know, connections. So the microglia are part of the support cell network. Now, healthy microglia have these extensions, almost like these arms, um, these extensions that come off of them, and they actually migrate and they move. And they, one of the jobs they do is they trim synaptic, you know, networks. And so you want the, you want healthy microglia because you want them to be able to trim the synaptic networks because you want synaptic networks to be ideal um, biomechanically and structurally to be able to transmit what they're trying to do. And so what happens is if microglia get injured, and they can get injured in many different ways, um, then they either get, they can get what's called activated or primed. There's a term called prime microglia where they lose the normal morphology and they become more looking like an amoeba without the projections. Um, and so what you want ideally is for them to still have some of the projections, but if they're still like an amoeba form, you want them to be like more of the M2 phase. Now the M2 phase is theoretically um, a beneficial phase. It's anti-inflammatory and it's producing neurotrophins like brain derived nerve growth factor, neurotrophic factor that, that it's, it's, it's pro support. Think of it as pro support and anti-inflammatory. The M1 phase is very inflammatory, producing a lot of inflammatory cytokines. It doesn't produce the neurotrophic factors um, and is, is part of the problem. So you say the M1 phase is part of the problem of ongoing brain damage. The M2 phase is augmenting repair and support. And so the question is, you know, how to shift the morphology, but it also brings up an interesting question. We often cannot get areas that have been injured in crime completely back to the normal microglial cells that, you know, we're going around and moving and pruning. Um, but we can try to shift them to the M2 phase. So the, the research on this, one of the most helpful things is flavonoids can help do this, like um, luteolin and apigen. And in terms of diet, um, Luteolin is a bit hard to get, but we can get it from radicchio lettuce. Um, and apigen we can get from celery and parsley. So I talk about the brain salad, which is going to at least have radicchio, celery, and parsley. But in addition, it's going to have broccoli sprouts because broccoli sprouts will activate NRF2, which will be, uh, you know, decrease inflammation and oxidative stress. Um, so... Um, 
then um, blueberries, um, you know, will will have this, you know, purple anthocyanin in them that also helps uh, with the morphology issues and also decreases oxidative stress. And I tell people to get the wild frozen ones because the wild frozen ones have much more purple than even regular organic blueberries. And I don't want anybody eating blueberries that aren't organic. So wild frozen ones are very purple and they're very good for you. Now, I'm looking into things like PEA and CBD um, in terms of this issue. But what's interesting is there's some research that PEA, um, certain things in combination um, will sort of neutralize each other. Um, so I've started using PEA in some people. I don't use CBD typically with patients unless there's certain indications. Um, because there is some information that PEA and CBD may not be as useful together. Very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about the role that a traumatic brain injury might play in, let's say, Lyme disease and co-infections or viruses that might have been present in the person's system for years or decades. Do you find that people that have chronic infections prior to their head injury are more likely then to have a more significant brain injury because they already had less reserve? Or conversely, do people that have a previous head injury potentially have a more severe presentation of Lyme disease if they get infected later? So how does the head injury impact our potential for the development of these chronic infections? And is there some immune shift that happens after a head injury in terms of Th1, Th2 balance? Yes. So it so happens there's research that supports that head injury decreases Th1. The um, Th1 system becomes less effective, you might say. Nat uh, head injuries seem to decrease natural killer cell population and activity. So everything you can think of in the innate immune system is, is going to get less functional. The Th2 system is going to increase in its actions. Um, and, and so you're going to have an immune shift and an immune dysfunction, which then may open the way for infection. Infection in hollow spaces like the gut, infection in other hollow spaces like the sinuses, possibly infection in the brain. Now, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that someone's going to get a brain infection after a head injury. It just means that the immune system is going to be less capable of of um, keeping, um, say, viruses in a dormant state or keeping uh, Lyme or co-infections in a dormant state because you can have reactivation of these problems after a uh, head injury. So if someone has uh, a lot of these issues um, and has had problems before, it's probably going to be, they may be reactivated and worse after the head injury that can cause um, a prolongation of symptoms so they need to be addressed but the best way to address them is to rebalance the immune system and not just go after them with you know trying to kill them dr bob navial talks about this concept of the cell danger response and so i'm i'm curious can a brain injury be the activating event or the trigger for the body going into a cell danger response or this stuck protected state well, you know, I've really looked into this, and I really like his work, and I think it's actually fascinating. Um, it's, you know, when, in, uh, when I was talking about excitotoxicity, the cells release, you know, ATP and, and all kinds of substances and parts of cells that will then, you know, trigger other cells and tell them, hey, there's a big problem here. Now, it seems like that it's possible that we need to consider a cell danger response, especially in people that have experienced severe fatigue before. I think they're more likely to go into a cell danger response than people that haven't. Um, so people that have Lyme co-infections, mold, other insults to the brain are probably likely to go into more of this fatigue and prolonged mitochondrial dysfunction than people that haven't had that. So it is something I consider um, I think it's difficult to find this in the research. 
You've talked about the importance of sleep in reducing neuroinflammation, supporting recovery from head injury. What are some of the things that are most effective for your TBI patients in terms of sleep support? And then generalizing that, what are some of the other keys to reducing neuroinflammation? Well, you know, it's very important for people to have a bedtime and um, most adults don't have a bedtime, so most people go to bed too late. They have a delayed onset sleep phase, so I want people going to bed after a head injury like 10-ish, 10.30, to wear blue light blocking glasses around 8, um, to get off their devices an hour before they want to go to sleep, have dimming lights so that they're not exposed to bright light, um, and, you know, take melatonin an hour and a half before they want to go to sleep. Because most people, if they take it, they take it right before bed. It doesn't work that way. It's a circadian rhythm adjuster. So 1.5 hours before they want to go to sleep, much better. Some people need controlled release melatonin to keep them asleep. Um, and then I also use tapping. I teach people tapping, the emotional freedom technique. And there's a tapping app that's really good. And if people wake up in the middle of the night, I'll have them. There's. I'll have them do some tapping for anxiety, a racing mind. Um, I'll also use some homeopathics for um, uh, racing mind that can be helpful. Um, but also exercise during the day augments sleep at night, um, and any kind of stress management can augment sleep at night. In terms of reducing neural inflammation, that's you know it's it's it's, it's a huge subject. So diet is really important. You know, an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, uh, I think you know EPA, DHA, but more DHA type oil is important. Healing leaky gut in the microbiome is extremely important because the GI tract in any mild to moderate head injury patient will often get disturbed. They can develop leaky gut, and the microbiome can change. They can have the LPS. Um, in the in the bloodstream going in the brain um, so and then treating the vagus can be very important in regard to that issue so working on the gut healing the gut um, is very important and then the direct things like you know the long beta curcumin and the uh, there is a supplement that contains the flavonoids that I use in my patients um, will be very important and then the frequency specific microcurrent um, definitely I use to decrease neural inflammation. So NRF2, you mentioned earlier as well. I know there's a connection there between inflammation also. What is NRF2? How do you support that in a recovery program? How do we activate this NRF2 pathway? Well, NRF2 is a transcription factor. And if it's activated, our bodies can use our own antioxidants and our own anti-inflammatory uh, products that it's like our own innate system of anti-inflammation and um, free radicals uh, suppression. So the NRF2 um, transcription factor um, can be activated in a number of different ways. I mean, aerobic exercise um, can activate it, but it needs to be done in, in more than just a very low level. Um, it's known that curcumin may be able to augment it. Um, DHA, um, omega-3 fish oil can do it. Um, uh, green tea may have some effect, um, but um, and and sulforaphane um, from broccoli sprouts may have some effect. So that's why, in every one of my patients, I'm having them doing certain things like these things to activate their own NRF2 system. Oxidative damage is another factor in head injury that you've mentioned in terms of pathophysiology. Um, what's the trigger or driver of the oxidative damage? And then what are some of the tools that you use to quench this excess oxidative stress? Um, well, the excitotoxicity and neural inflammation are, are big triggers. Um, there's any kind of mitochondrial damage is a big trigger. Um, and so, um, you know, we're activating, I'm activating NRF2 with the things I talked about. Um, and um, there are other things that, that um, you can use to, you know, quench free radicals, um, like, you know, the polyphenols and blueberries, the wild blueberries, um, uh, using um, alpha lipoic acid. I, also, there's certain types of free radicals that are very damaging like peroxynitrite, 
Um, so I will use molecular hydrogen, these little tablets that dissolve in water and have people dissolve in about eight to 10 ounces of water and drink it within two minutes of it being dissolved um, to quench free radicals. Um, so I think we can deal with that fairly effectively. Mitochondria are very numerous and dense in the brain. So how do we support the mitochondria to produce more energy to be used in support of the healing process? And is there a role for red light therapy or photobiomodulation in terms of supporting the mitochondria? Well, there's different aspects of supporting mitochondria. It's not just increasing ATP. We want to support the membranes. Uh, we want we want the mitochondrial membranes to be extremely healthy. We want to support the electron transport train in the mitochondria. Um, there's a lot of aspects to supporting the mitochondria. Now, uh, B vitamins and minerals are extremely important. So I want everybody on a really good either B vitamin product or um, on a multiple that has methylated B vitamins. The only one sometimes they don't use is methylated B12 if they have a comp gene issue. But I want everybody to be on good B vitamins. I want them to be on you know enough magnesium and zinc because there's so many aspects of what's going on in terms of mito and in mitochondria that we need the right minerals. Um, so a good multiple will usually cover those bases. Um, CoQ10, I think there's a role for, but I think people need a lot more CoQ10 than just 50 to 100 uh, milligrams. Um, and sometimes CoQ10 doesn't seem to be as well um, absorbed. So we might need to use higher levels, use it twice a day, use different methods to get it absorbed better. Um, and I forgot to say glutathione is very important with oxidative stress. So in, in increasing uh, NAC and glutathione is very important for oxidative stress. Um, so that can also aid mitochondria. Um, NAD plus and methods of increasing NAD plus can be extremely effective for people to increase brain energy so they have less brain fatigue, um, increases mitochondrial function, but um, we need a fair amount of it. And there's been different mechanisms of delivery. There's the sublingual form, there's nasal sprays, there's a nasal spray called Synapsin, um, there's, um, there's sprays that go in the mouth to try to increase it. So I think that should be a goal. Um, frequency specific microcurrent increases ATP production. Um, so that's my primary tool. Um, laser can increase ATP production. So I can, I think there's a, there's um, um, reason to use laser around the head, but also around the neck because if people have a full head of hair, the laser is not going to penetrate very well. Um, so that's my approach to improving uh, mitochondrial function. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I put on my transdermal NAD just before talking with you so that my brain can hopefully try and keep up with you a bit. So <laughs> let's yeah, talk that's another mode of delivery. That's a really good mode of delivery. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit now about the loss of neurons and the synaptic density issue that results from changes in blood supply, oxygen delivery, mitochondrial damage, excitotoxicity, all of these things that you've talked about. How do we minimize the loss of neurons and actually support the creation of new neurons or neurogenesis? Well, that's limiting. So the first part of that, part, how do we minimize the loss and then how do we increase the uh, neuron density and the synaptic density. So the first part is saying, okay, um, what do we? What can we do to decrease neural inflammation? What can we do to like decrease um, excitotoxicity? What can we do to augment mitochondrial functions so the neurons don't die? All these pathophysiologies that I've been talking about. You know, how do you improve cell signaling? Um, those are really important. How do you know? So it depends when we see the patient. Because if we use hyperbaric oxygen initially, um, we think that might that might save neurons. You know, if I use frequency specific microcurrent, I get the patient early enough that might save neurons. If I'm interrupting the neural inflammation, if if I'm working on uh, quenching the free radicals and the excitotoxicity, that will decrease the loss of neurons supposedly. Um, that's why those things are so important, and they're not being done. With the average person, the average person with this sort of let's see how you do and we'll see you back in a month and we'll record your symptoms. None of that is being done. It's just all that, you know, secondary brain damage is going on. So then um, when we want to think about supporting neurogenesis, 
you know, nerve stem cells are only in a few places in the brain. I wish they were in every part of the brain. Um, that would make me very happy, but they're only in a few parts of the brain. They're in a place called the dentate gyrus. They're, they're in the hippocampus area. They're only in a few places. And so there are some things that can be done to augment stem cell migration. Now, with a head injury, supposedly, um, even if you don't do anything, um, stem cells you know, may be mobilized. There's information uh, to show that. But we want to increase the survival of these stem cells, therefore decreasing neural inflammation, excitotoxicity, free radicals, and augmenting mitochondrial function, and decreasing autoimmune mechanisms, improving the immune system in the brain. It's all very important to allow stem cells that have migrated to survive. And then there's certain things that will um, improve their survival, like I think low-dose lithium um, and taurine um, and even melatonin um, have been shown in some studies to improve survival of nerve stem cells or even augment their migration. Taurine has been shown in some studies to augment their migration. Um, and then we want to increase neurotrophic factors like brain-derived uh, nerve growth factor and other nerve growth factors because um, those are thought to help with nerve growth and especially synaptic density um, and projections from the dendrites and, and encourage the growth of the neurons um, and help preserve them because they're, it's almost like the fertilizer and, and water almost for your plants. Those tr trophic factors are really important for um, decreasing uh, loss, for promoting um, the, the maximum amount of healthy neurons. And, and then, you know, we want to promote synaptic density by challenging areas of the brain. That's the brain training part of it. We have to challenge areas of the brain, stimulate it so that we have more synaptic density. How significant is lithium orotate in supporting these growth factors and nerve stem cells? Is it a big player in a recovery protocol? Well, I will use it in every one of my patients. And part of the problem I have is having people think that, it, that I don't think they have bipolar because I'm using the lithium. Now, if someone's already in lith on lithium on high doses, I keep them on those doses. So if they already have high bolt, uh, if they have bipolar and someone put them on lithium, I'll keep on the high doses. But in general, I use lower dose lithium, like 20 milligrams of lithium orotate. I think it's pretty important. I, I think that I have better results than the people that will go on the low dose lithium. I haven't really had anybody have side effects on it. It's low dose. It's only 20 milligrams. Um, but um, it does seem to stimulate brain-derived uh, growth factor in studies. Um, it increases nerve growth factor um, in, in multiple areas of the brain. Um, it increases brain-derived nerve growth factor. Um, it may induce nerve stem cells um, in the hippocampus. Um, so I think it's pretty important. It's not very expensive. It's pretty important. It usually has no side effects. You've said in some of your past lectures that if you could use only one supplement in brain injury, that that supplement would be taurine. Why is taurine so pivotal? Um, taurine is, um, it helps regulate osmolarity. So in osmolality, so in the initial stages when there's so much fluid congestion in the brain, it's important. It seems to have studies that show that it, augments nerve stem cells. Um, it may be involved in, augment, uh, in, in modulating excitotoxicity. So um, taurine can have a number of roles. It's very inexpensive. Um, and um, uh, so I say um, I, I have everybody on taurine, a um, thousand milligrams twice a day. I take it every day myself. <laughs> nice. We know that exercise is important, healing the brain. You've talked about it in terms of NRF2 activation, increasing the BDNF, helping with plasticity, improving sleep, decreasing stress and anxiety. Is there a specific type of exercise that is more ideal for supporting brain healing? Well, aerobic exercise seems to be uh, more effective than strength training. And in the studies, the aerobic exercise needs to be in a zone. 
So the zone theoretically would be 220 minus the person's age times 70% and 220 minus the person's age times 80% and somewhere in that 70 to 80% or 85% zone. Um, for about 45 minutes, it's time dependent. Now, any exercise is better than none. But in order to stimulate brain-derived nerve growth factor with exercise and stimulate NRF2, we need to have enough of the intensity to accomplish this. And this is often a problem with people because they don't want to get to that intensity because they're so fatigued from the mitochondrial dysfunction. But it's very important that they try to get to that goal. Strength training could have a role, but, but not as much of a role as the, the aerobic uh, training in terms of brain healing. And then, you know, um, training balance is also important if they have balanced dysfunction. But that's more important in terms of healing the cerebellum if they've had cerebellar injury. You've mentioned uh, brain training applications. Are there specific apps that people can use on their phone or devices that are helpful in moving their brain towards health? Well, so what I would say is brain training, you've got to think of it as increasing synaptic density, synaptic connections. And so you want to think about where does this person need to improve brain reserve? What parts of the brain are still having problems, then we need to train those parts of the brain. So it, say if it's the hippocampus in memory, I'll have people actually get um, animal uh, memory cards and, and put them on the carpet and turn them over. I'll have people use that Simon game, you know, for memory. I'll have them, if they're having problems with words or word finding, get, um, you know, vocabulary cards and use those to train their brain. Um, and then um, I do like Brain HQ. Um, so Brain HQ, I think, is really good. Luminosity is good, um, but I think Brain HQ has, has, has a lot of training for people. And, and so, sometimes people have problems with computers, and they, they're light sensitive. They can't use Brain HQ. So there are certain books that, um, you know, they're about $10 on brain training that I have people do. People have to do multiple different things, um, not just crossword puzzles, multiple different things. And the training has to be particular to the region of the brain that is having the problem. You mentioned that the vagus nerve can be injured when a head injury occurs. Um, that leads me to thinking of all the other effects then, things like SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that can be a result of vagus nerve dysfunction. You mentioned that frequency-specific microcurrent can be helpful in many areas, but in vagus nerve particularly as well. Do you use any vagal nerve stimulators? What are some of the tools you use to optimize the health of the vagus nerve? Um, the primary, I, I would say the primary tool that I use to optimize the health of the vagus nerve is frequency specific microcurrent because it's so effective. Um, and so, um, and I'm good at that. I have that available. Um, I will have people gargle. Um, I'll have people sing. <laughs> I'll have people do vagus nerve exercises. Um, but I think often the vagus nerve needs to be actually healed, like physically healed, like if it's been tractioned. The other thing that can happen to the vagus nerve is that lipopolysaccharide and other things can actually go retrograde up to the up the vagus nerve into the brain. So we often have to treat the vagus nerve with frequency specific microcurrent um, for the things that might actually be damaging it. Then you have to um, work on healing the gut. I mean, you have to assess for SIBO in people, microbiome changes leaky gut, intestinal permeability, and work on healing those things with a functional med medicine perspective, along with healing the vagus. Because if someone has persistent SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you're going to have brain symptoms from that. But the, they'll also probably, you know, have uh, uh, vagus nerve problems. And vagus nerve problems after head injury can contribute to SIBO because if motility slows down, um, then we're, a person's more likely to get SIBO. And I, I think that it's very difficult to heal SIBO without some mechanism or treatment of the vagus nerve. That's why in my programs to heal SIBO, um, I will use you know, treatment for the vagus nerve, um, both the exercises and the microcurrent. And, and if I see patients with SIBO without head injuries, I have much better results than if I don't treat the vagus nerve. Talk to us just a little bit as we start wrapping up about what foods are the most supportive of optimizing brain healing. Well, first of all, I say I want people to buy, choose organic because I want to limit all the neurotoxins. So 
choose organic, then if they're going to eat meat, it's going to be grass fed, grass finished. I don't want GMOs in the diet because they can adversely affect the gut um, for sure. And maybe the blood brain barrier. Um, so we want to increase things with, um, you know, these flavonoids. So like, um, uh, parsley, celery, um, radicchio, lettuce, cloves have a lot of flavonoids so they could add cloves to a smoothie. Um, and, um, so they can make like a, um, a salad with those different, um, things in them and add broccoli sprouts. And I, I really like to make pestos. So I have these brain pestos that I have people make and you can get these pesto makers. There's one by Hamilton beach. That's a glass pesto maker and it's incredible. It's only like $26, $30. And, um, so I like the glass cause it doesn't have plastics. And so you make these brain pestos where you load up like parsley, you know, and then extra virgin olive oil, hopefully one with high polyphenols like the cornichii olive from Greece, and then you put um, broccoli, uh, you know, parsley, broccoli sprouts, watercress for the liver, um, radi some radicchio, um, organic pine nuts, and um, um, and then uh, uh, and blend it up. And then you can even put a little bit of um, dandelion for the liver as well. And then you got a brain liver pesto. <laughs> That's yeah. really helpful. And then, you know, people can use that and then put that on things that they might otherwise not want to eat, like the healthy cruciferous vegetables. Um, and then choline is really important. We need a lot of choline to heal the mitochondrial membranes and the, and the, and the cellular membranes in the brain. So things that contain choline are pretty important. I have people go on, you know, the pasture raised eggs, um, Chicken, um, certain you know, organic chicken, pasture chicken may be helpful for that. Um, and then I don't want acrylamide in the diet, so we want to limit things that are browned. You know, like if they're going to – we don't want them browning meats, browning eggs. We want to really, really limit brown things. Don't want them eating chips because those are browned. Don't want them eating much crackers. Those are browned. So those advanced glycosylated end products will also be um, inflammatory. Um, but the acrylamide is also in coffee. So um, if, I, if my patients want to drink coffee, I want them drinking a very low acrylamide coffee, um, which is a very interesting thing because all coffee contains acrylamide. Um, I, uh, so first of all, the coffee is going to be organic. Um, I do like a coffee called Purity because they check for acrylamide levels and they have figured out the roasting temperatures for the, uh, you know, the temperatures to roast to have the less acrylamide in it. So acrylamide is kind of important to decrease as well because it's a neurotoxin. We talked about oxygenation being low in brain injury. What are some of the tools that can be used to improve oxygen? You mentioned in the early stages, you might use hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Can something like pulsed electromagnetic field therapy be helpful in terms of circulation and oxygenation? You know, um, I would say what I use mostly is HBOT, um, hyperbaric oxygen, and I use vinpocetine and ginkgo. Those are the tools that I use for oxygenation. Um, I don't, I mean, I have tried different pulse magnetic field devices, and I'm not really clear on how they might improve circulation. Now, there are some pulse magnetic field device like some of the mats that might improve microcirculation. Um, but I don't think that's maybe the, the most direct way to do it. So, but I'm, I'm not adverse to that as long as they're not being exposed to electromagnetic fields. But I just don't know if there's been demonstration in the brain that say a PEMF mat will increase brain circulation. I know in the feet or the extremities that, that it might peptides are a popular topic these days. Do you find or use peptide therapies in your patients with traumatic brain injuries? Well, yes, but um, like I'll use BPC-157, um, especially to heal the gut. So I use it orally. Um, and um, I might use it injectable for someone that has a lot of injuries because often I'm treating their injuries too. Um, but um, and there was a peptide called cerebral lysin that was very helpful, especially in chronic head injuries. It's not available anymore. So um, that has to do with certain regulatory agencies with peptides. 
So unfortunately, um, I haven't had access to um, you know the peptides that I wanted, like cerebral lysin. I don't think anything was as good as a peptide for brain healing as cerebral lysin. Um, now there are some um, uh, pe peptides to actually sh you know help the immune system. So sometimes I might use uh, alpha one, uh, thymosin alpha one for that. Um, but in general, um, more using just BPC-157 to heal the gut lining and people that have had gut problems um, after head injuries or my patients with GI problems. Um, and, you know, there's the issue about augmenting growth hormone with peptides if someone has really low growth hormone. And that, there may be a role for that, too, with head injury after head injury if they have really I, low IGF-1. Um, there might be a role for the peptides there, too. Have you found any role for stem cells or exosome therapy in recovering your patients from brain injury? Well, there's definitely research on this um, that um, both certain types of stem cells and exosomes may be helpful. Um, the mechanism of action, I don't think, has been that well determined. Um, and making sure that the source of the exosomes, you know, is really clean is really important. In my programs, I have not used stem cells or exosomes, um, and uh, but I do. Th I, I think there's a role in, in, in definitely in really difficult cases, especially moderate to severe head injuries. I think they should be tried because um, those cases need um, uh, sort of much more aggressive treatment. And there are some uh, studies on the use of them IV um, that I, that I think are encouraging. What's the relevance of this information for anybody wanting to keep their brain healthy, even if they haven't had a head injury or for potentially preventing things down the road like mild cognitive impairment or dementia or treating those issues if you're already experiencing them to some degree? I think there's a tremendous amount of relevance. So as I've delved into like how to heal the brain after head injury and the pathophysiology and understanding the function of each brain region, um, that I've realized that certain types of pathophysiology are really important to look at with anybody with cognitive impairment. You know, someone says, oh, I feel brain fog. I, I just don't feel like I'm, I'm thinking as quickly. Or, um, you know, I get fatigue using my, my brain. Or they're having problems with planning or organizing or word finding or their memory. Um, and a lot of people are. It's, you don't have to have a diagnosis of MCI or mild cognitive impairment. Um, and, and certainly people can have these problems with mold and biotoxins, and there's many things that can cause this, many things that can cause cognitive impairment. So I think people need to be thinking about one thing, how do I keep my brain healthy? You know, it's just like, how do I keep my heart healthy? Um, how do I keep my muscles healthy? And that's become an important question, I think, that people should ask, or how do I keep my patient's brain healthy? How do I assess my patient's brain function as part of keeping them well? And so the, 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 there are certain pathophysiologies that I think are really kind of important to think about. Um, neural inflammation is really important to think about in terms of keeping your brain healthy and, and treating patients that have cognitive impairment of any sort because a lot of us have neural inflammation and I don't even ask the question anymore. Do you have any neural inflammation? I think we all have neural inflammation. How do we modulate it? How do we keep it to a minimum? Um, you know, um, excitotoxicity. Do we have, is there much excitotoxicity? That's another thing. I think mitochondrial health in the brain is really important in supporting mitochondrial health. I think sort of Activating NRF2 is really important to decrease oxidative stress. I think protecting the brain from electromagnetic fields um, is really important. Um, and then this whole thing about autoimmunity, I think anybody with brain symptoms um, that hasn't had a head injury really should be treated for antibodies to the blood-brain barrier and antibodies to different brain tissues. Because if there is brain autoimmunity, the immune system's in significant dysfunction, and then there's going to be a lot more loss of neurons and microglial cells. So assessing and treating that is really important, along with assessing and treating the gut 
um, because the, the, if someone has leaky gut and intestinal permeability and blood brain barrier permeability, that's a really, that's like two gates that are open that shouldn't be open at the same time. Um, so I think brain health is really important. There's a lot of crossover between the pathophysiology of um, brain injury and the pathophysiology of any kind of brain dysfunction. I think it's really important for us to think about, especially the ones that, that, that I that I mentioned um, in terms of keeping the brain healthy or helping people that have cognitive dysfunction to improve and recover from it. Yeah, that's beautiful. So we've taken this now from a conversation that was helping people with head injury and, and really generalizing your approach and your protocol to being able to help essentially any of us. And so I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing. I feel like many people with chronic illnesses have probably not explored the potential for head injury as a contributor to their condition. Seems like that could be worthwhile. So how can people find practitioners that do this work? Um, are you doing telemedicine consultations now for people that need support or do they need to come see you in Seattle? And then have you published your approach in any journals or books or anything that people can learn more about your work? Yes, well, I do telemedicine consultations, um, and I will do telemedicine consultations, you know, all around around the country, um, or even in Canada or elsewhere. Now, you know, because of licensing issues, I'm licensed in the state of Washington. If I do telemedicine, I usually have to consult with the person's um, care provider, whether it's an acupuncturist or a physician. Then I'm consulting with their care provider, and I do telemedicine consults. Um, all around the, the, the country in Canada. Um, and Canada. Um, and very few people know this program. I mean, I've given lectures at the Washington Association of Naturopathic Medicine, lectures to the British Columbia Association of Naturopathic Medicine, and lectures uh, for your meeting, um, the Forum for Integrated Medicine, and, um, and then to the Institute of Functional Medicine. Um, but I would say that this is a very... Um, um, uh, intensive program where it requires a lot of um, not just listening to one lecture, but using it and um, really working with the material, assessing the brain regions. And so I don't necessarily have a network of people that I can refer to now to do this program. Um, I just don't. I, I'd, I'd like to set up a training program for it at some point, but I haven't done that. But I have written an article, um, and it's in the Townsend Letter, uh, May 2019. Someone could just Google Townsend Letter, May 2019, bring up that article. And then I've written a very extensive book chapter on the integrative medicine approach to healing the brain. And it's coming out um, in the Oxford University uh, Press book on, uh, it's called Integrative Neurology. I'm hoping it's going to be published in um, the fall. Um, I heard it was going to be published in September. Um, and then my website, um, www.peakmedicine.com, P-E-A-K medicine.com, has links to um, uh, a documentary, a docu-series that was done, the Broken Brain docu-series, so people can download that. It has links to the Townsend Letter, um, but also has information on my practice and telemedicine, peak medicine. That's how people can reach me. My last question is the same for every guest, and that is, what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Well, uh, I try to work out every day <laughs> for at least 45 minutes. Um, what's really interesting is there's new information that while you're working out, if you challenge your brain at the same time, you create even more brain-derived nerve growth factor. So if I get on my home elliptical and then I'm watching a challenging webinar or listening to a challenging lecture, that will work my brain at the same time. Um, so I try to do that. Um, so working out, and then I, I, um, I don't actually have wireless in our home. It's all wired through ethernet. Um, we had our bedroom um, painted with this um, EMF shielding paint and the windows with something called clear coat put on them to decrease electromagnetic fields in the bedroom. Um, I take um, things for my brain every day, like taurine. I'm on cogumen. Um, I have an NAD that I take under the tongue. Um, I'm doing all kinds of things for mitochondrial health. 
um, I'm challenging my brain constantly because I'm constantly learning, um, just constantly, you know, going to meetings, reading articles, constantly learning, challenging my brain. Um, and then, you know, I try to manage stress. So I do the tapping to manage the stress because stress is not good for your brain. Um, so, um, and uh, I run frequency specific microcurrent on myself and my brain sometimes, believe it or not. And I even have a laser cap that I use. Nice, so I'm nice. doing a lot to keep, I mean, a lot, my work depends on my brain. So I better have really good brain function. So um, yeah, those are some of the things that I do. Beautiful. I first learned about you from Dr. Dietrich Klinghart, and he has tremendous respect for you. I've heard him speak of you very, very highly. And so that uh, I, I think says a lot because I hold him very highly. It's clear that your brain is very, very functional. And it's also clear in our conversation in today's conversation, but also past conversations that you just really care a lot about finding solutions for your patients, that you have a, a very strong passion for the work you do in helping to minimize the struggle of other people. And so I just want to thank you and honor you for what you're doing, for all your work, and appreciate your time and generously sharing with us today. Thank you very much. To learn more about today's guest, visit peakmedicine.com. That's peakmedicine.com. Peakmedicine.com. Thanks for your interest in today's show. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. If you'd like to be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. And this and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.